What's going on, everybody? It's Noah back for, I think, the fourth weekly F1 car talk. I'm joined by a very special guest, and in this case, very special breaker and buff. If you want to go say hello. What's up, everybody? Hello from uh, Northern Virginia. All right, so um, I wanted to get buff on because I've had a lot of uh, collectors on, but I haven't really had anybody from the break side of things. I thought talking about some blowout stuff, break side might be interesting. So if you want to kind of just go introduce yourself, uh, kind of how when you started collecting and stuff like that, that'd be perfect. Uh, so I guess the uh, the Cliff Notes version of who I am and collecting is I've been collecting cards since I was like two years old. Um, I really started collecting when I was maybe nine with Pokemon cards. I opened a PayPal account when I was 11. <laughs> um, yeah, I know. It took a lot of convincing for my parents to do that one. Oh, I can um, believe it. Yeah, I was back when like, I was like, I feel like I was the second customer on PayPal. But um, <laughs> Uh, I did that all throughout high school, uh, then through college, um, wound up getting a job in the real world that I was able to parlay my experience between, uh, doing group breaks, my real life job and my uh, past card experience, having run my own business um, as a teenager into a job with blowout cards. I've been working there in pretty much every capacity you could possibly imagine for the past, uh, I think it's been eight years now, eight or nine years. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it's been a long time. It's. Longer than I thought when I say it out loud. Um, <laughs> but now um, I also still I continue to work for Blowout, um, and I also have been fortunate enough to uh, launch my own my own business on the side, which is um, Buffs Breaks. Um, some of you may may know me, may not, but uh, I work for Blah, and then also uh, continues to side by side with Blowout um, through my LLC. So do a little bit of everything. That's yeah, it's perfect. Um, yeah, so like Blowout, like. One of the biggest, like, well, I would say, I think, I don't know if it's fair to say, but probably one of the biggest distributors, kind of like to the general public for cards. So we're we're, uh, we're the largest, I guess I would call us an e-retailer, or okay. an e-wholesale. Um, we sell direct to consumer. We also sell to other um, other hobby shop, uh, hobby shops and distributors that will sell direct to consumer. So we uh, we kind of dabble in a little bit of both. But yeah, we're probably uh, definitely the largest one. We're, we're the Walmart or Target. Okay, gotcha. Okay. And then how, then uh, specifically to the F1 side, how did you get into F1, like cards, or even just into the sport in general? I'll be honest, I had dumb luck. <laughs> dumb luck. <laughs> I was doing breaks on the forums, and um, I had a, a customer of mine say, hey, Tops is coming out with Formula One cards. I told him I literally know nothing about anything about Formula One. Yeah. Uh, I didn't think I went as far as to say that I think racing is stupid. <laughs> At that point, I had never watched a race in my life. Yeah. Um, and... I put up a dynasty break in the good old days where uh, a dynasty case cost us about $2,000. Yeah. Think about that for a second. Yeah. But, um, we did a dynasty break. It took about a year before we could actually open it because the product was delayed so much. Yeah. I opened it, um, had no idea what I was talking about, but everyone seemed to enjoy it. Um, and <laughs> then they asked me to tops Chrome. So same thing. And I felt like such an idiot on stream. Like I felt so stupid on stream. Um, trying to pronounce people's names and having nothing like relevant to say about anything. Oh. Um, that you know, someone gave me a heads up to watch Drive to Survive, and I watched it, and I blew through all three seasons in like three days. Okay. And ever since then, just like full on immersion into any any content I can find, I absolutely love it. I, I I almost feel ashamed that it took me so long to realize how awesome Formula One was. So yeah, like big regret. Yeah, like like that's me. Like the similar like. Like, my first love for racing was NASCAR because that's what my grandpa loved watching. So, like, just, like, the racing side. It's funny because, like, how, like, F1 is, like, the new sexy, like, the new sexy kind of yeah. collect collectible. Whereas, like, NASCAR is still seen as, like, kind of, like, the weird odd child out, which is always, it's so funny to me. But, like, it's funny just how quickly F1, like, blew up with the cards. And especially because the drops are survive, which is, so that's probably, like, I'd seen, like, I don't know if I'd seen races before then, but I could have named you a couple of F1 drivers before I watched Drive to Survive, but after that, it really kind of took off for me. Well, it, is, it was a combination of a couple things. I mean, I think Drive to Survive was huge by... It's a great way um, to explain the dynamic about F1, which I think is the, probably the most intriguing part of, of F1. I mean, the yeah. races are great, but when you sit and actually watch full races... There'll be lulls in them. There'll be some races that are decided in lap one or two, as long as you know nothing goes wrong. Yeah. Um, but it's the behind the scenes dynamic with all the other stuff that you don't see by just watching the race that really makes F one interesting, at least to me. Um, in addition to the races themselves, but um, you know F one also has 
has another great thing going for it. It's got a couple of things going for it, actually. Um, it, one is the setup, uh, the way that the season is structured and that you have, you know, your X amount of races. I mean, I know it's been different the past couple of years because of COVID, but you got your 20, 21 races, 23 races, whatever it might be yeah. uh, this year. Um, they're always on Sunday. They're at, I mean, most of them are roughly around the same time, except for the ones that take place in, in Asia, um, Singapore, Japan. Um, then the U S ones are a little bit different, but they're right around the same time. They, for the most part, don't really interrupt any other sports. And it's a two day event, three day. If you want to watch practice. Yeah. Um, so it's not like, it's got a little bit of a different dynamic than baseball and basketball and hockey that, you know, oh, it it's, does. Where it's where you, you got to be on top of stuff every day of the week. You know, you got a game on a Tuesday at one time, then you got another game on Wednesday at uh, three hours later. So it's, it's nice. It's, it's easy for the public to pick up and take an hour and a half to sit down and watch an F1 race if they want. Um, especially when there's really not anything else going on. So yeah. And like speaking, speaking on the point of like every day, like, like, so last two years ago, I did my first ever try it. This is completely off topic, but I did my first ever try in fantasy basketball. Oh, it's rough. And fantasy basketball. Cause you can do like weekly or daily. And they decided they want to do yeah. daily. And like, when I play fantasy football and it's weekly, like you don't notice, like you still take a little bit, like you'll take a little bit of time in the week. Like, I don't know, maybe I take an hour for all my different leagues for fantasy football. But like, I didn't realize like I have to do like 30 to 45 minutes every day for daily. And it was just too much for me. I couldn't do it. Yeah. It's, it's so much. It's like, that's what is part of why the NFL is so successful. Um, uh, you know, NFL is probably the number, the number it's, probably in the top five or six global sports. Yeah. Um, but F1's right behind that. F1 hit 82 million unique viewers last year. Oh, I tuned know. In for, that's a ton. That's yeah. so many. Um, and it's the the greatest thing is you never have to worry. What time is my team playing today? Are they playing today? You know it's Sunday at 9 o'clock for the most part here on the East Coast, <laughs> or 8 o'clock or 10 o'clock, depending on where uh, where the, the race is. Yeah. You know that's when it's on. It's easy. It's great. It's great for the uh, the end consumer to – to have that structure people love structure yeah it's funny it's funny because um the rate like for me like i can never catch a live race because like it's like a 5 a.m start over in like the west coast five to six yeah. so i like, think this is the only time where the east coast has an advantage we uh, yeah exactly we got the short end of the stick on everything else but for f1 you should see how happy i am right now i got the biggest smile on oh yeah i know because then like the, it was funny because last year they when they were in turkey i uh, i was watching that race and I remember the start time was so early in the morning that I decided I'd rather just stay up overnight just to watch it. Cause I think it was like a two, I think it was a 3 a.m. start. Yeah. And cause, but like, and it was like technically like for me, I felt like Saturday night, technically Sunday morning. And oh, I knew yeah. I had nothing that Sunday morning. So I was like, well, I'll just like stay up till like 4 30 in the morning when it finishes. And it's and I'm, funny that you said, cause I, that's why I was so sad about Japan. Um, and I think Singapore was the other one that was canceled this year. I was so excited for those because they're like 1 a.m. Eastern time. So that's literally, it's Saturday night. Yeah. For me. I was so excited for those, and now we don't get either one. Yeah, that's why That's why I'm very thankful for when the U.S. Grand Prix goes on because that's like a 10, it's like a 10 or 11 a.m. start time for me. Like, perfect for me to sit down and watch. Yeah, I will uh, I will be in attendance next year in Miami. Uh, you, can, you can bet your bottom dollar on that one. Yeah, I want to. <laughs> I want to go. It's just a matter of uh, what I need to. I still like haven't even checked what the dates are for it yet. I still need to look at all that stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm still worrying on saving money so I can go uh, all out, get really immersed into the uh, the VIP experience. So we'll see. No, yeah, that's how I want. I want to definitely go to like, like I think somebody there was somebody who asked like if you could go to any race, which one it would be, and like I don't know. Eventually, I want to go to the sing. I want to go to Singapore, like under the lights. Like that Saturday night, just or I think maybe it's even Sunday night, just like that nighttime race is just so awesome to me. Yeah, Singapore was one of my favorite ones. Uh, I've obviously never seen one live, but on um, the drive to survive, that was one of my favorite circuits. And yeah. I've always wanted to go to Baku, just in yeah. general, uh, city. Um, so that's on my list. And then um, as a big Verstappen guy, I got to go to the Red Bull Ring. And then I think the other one that everyone probably wants to check off is Monaco, just yeah. for the experience. So those are those are the, the four ones on my tentative list right now. So. Yeah, it's funny. Um, before we get into the boxes, I had one thing. Um, I was so it wasn't when I was talking to Justin or Chargers Twenty One. It yeah. was he was talking to somebody else, and I was listening. And he said how um, everybody says they want to go to Monaco, but he said Monaco's on the bottom of his list. 
because he said that everything is so like commercialized and like expensive like rich glamorous like there's barely any yeah. public seating and the public seating that is there is like terrible but like it's uh, you're not wrong you're not yeah. wrong i actually did a lot of research into monaco uh, when i first started getting into to f1 trying to find a race that i could go to and i um i have a friend she's a flight attendant she went to monaco during not not a race season yeah and he was she was surprised by how um inexpensive the the area was um, outside of a you know some like some yeah. casinos, or oh, yeah. she, was, she was actually like wildly surprised by how inexpensive the area was, given all the like the hype and um, the the way that most people think about Monaco, you know. Yeah. So, but during race week, yeah. I was looking stuff up, and I compared with her kind of what she paid for hotels and stuff like that, and I was looking around at what people paid for race week and stuff like that. It is an absurd, absurd markup. Yeah. Like you would not even believe. You wouldn't even believe it. And, you know, people sit on the hillside, on the, the one hillside uh, yeah. outside of the city to overlook just to get a glimpse of the race because that's what a lot of uh, a lot of just normal people can afford. That yeah. was like a, what my research told me is that I might be sitting on a hill if I want to go to Monaco. Otherwise, I'm probably giving a kidney. Yeah. <laughs> one day. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so I wanted to uh, – so since I got you on as the Berker, I wanted to kind of go over kind of some of these like hobby box – um, cases and kind of just your opinions on prices and where you think they could go. Cause you're kind of that yeah. guy. Yeah. So like, I wanted to kind of just first touch on this year's 2020 boxes and how they're already at almost 12,000 a case. Like it's ridiculous to me. Cause I remember like when, like they were like still like 5,000 a case and that was a lot of money. So I'm curious, like what your thoughts are, where this is going to go, like how kind of just like how rare it is, stuff like that. Well, so we kind of know the print runs, right? Yeah. Uh, we figured out the print runs on Sapphire and Chrome. Um, so we know it's not a lot in comparison to other more... Um, like baseball, more football, football, basketball. Baseball, basketball, any, anything, any other sport. I mean, maybe the only exception is you might find some stuff in, in hockey because Upper Deck doesn't crank the presses because um, yeah. uh, the demand isn't as high. Yeah. So we already know that the product one of the most... or if if not the most limited product that's probably been released this year and that has come out um, in a commercial setting. So yeah. that's already a great start for it. The other thing that's that's really boosting the value here is you have the Topps Chrome brand, which, you know, it dates back to 1996 in yep. basketball and um, baseball. And it's it the Topps Chrome brand really had one of the, the setups. But I, I call it the setups. When you look back at iconic sets in sports throughout the um, – Throughout like the past, I would say 30 or 30, 40 years, right? Yeah. You have 80, 87 Fleer. Yeah. You have 96, 97 Topps Chrome Basketball. Yeah. You have 2003, 2004 Exquisite Basketball. Yeah. And then you have 12, 13 Prism Basketball, yeah. right? These are like your really big iconic sets. And then 2000 Contenders Football for a yeah. different reason. But the first four that I mentioned, they all have one of the same things, like the, the same set of things going for it. It was the first year that they made the product mm -hmm. and they had an unbelievable rookie class. Unbelievable. That's right. Why, and so I wanted to, I'm going to jump in quickly. Like when you're going over iconic things, there's only one that you didn't say that I thought of immediately. And that was 2011 tops update, like the tops design for the trout. See, so 2011 tops update. I think the card is iconic. Not so much. The set is iconic. I think that's um, fair. I think, I think of it more. Cause like being like, like, I just think of it, like, as they have, like, the Altuve, like, all just the big names in it, too. Yeah. I mean, it's a great set. Oh, but, like, I but like I still can agree that it's, out of the ones you've listed, it's below all those, like. Yeah, no, but, no. I mean, the Trout card, as far as modern cards go, that's, I mean, that's kind of like the poster child for, like, the, you know, look at what a base card is, um, you know, look at look at a card in a dollar box and see where it is now. That's, like, that's kind of the poster child for that, that yeah. segment of the market. That's so, fair, yeah. We're not disagreeing with you there. I uh, 100. percent No, I I get I, I, I get what you're saying 100. percent You can continue. Yeah. So um. But yeah. So you know you got the Topps Chrome brand, and then on top of that, you know we all have three sets here. We have three sets. Like just a quick sidebar. We have Chrome, we have Sapphire, and then we have Dynasty. Dynasty. Yeah. While it has the only on card autos, each one of these three sets offers something else. Dynasty has your on card autos, right? But yeah. there's no real true card in there to own. I mean, I guess you can say the flag patches maybe. But, but still, even no then, those aren't even like you. You don't need those cards, like. Correct. I mean, they're great to have. A lot of it's only half a flag too, which is kind of annoying. Yeah. Um, at least for me, um, I, I would rather have them 
instead of numbering them to four, number them to two and give me the whole flag, turn it sideways, give me the whole flag. Um, but there's no real card. There's no the card for people to chase. There might be a card that someone can chase if you're looking at the, the one of one Hamilton that we don't know if it's real or not, uh, <laughs> the Verstappen with the, the giant Red Bull logo on the glove. So that kind of holds Dynasty back, but it, it does have our only on-card autographs, right? Yeah. Um, brand name doesn't mean much, though, for Dynasty. It's been a just kind of average product um, since they released it in baseball in 2013. So okay. with Chrome, though, Chrome is for everyone. Everyone can get into Chrome. There's enough, when you look at the base, the variations, the parallels, there's enough to go around between Chrome and Sapphire that that's going to be the one that um, is going to be appealing to the public. So yeah. that's where you're going to see the demand start to rise because people aren't going to be interested in Dynasty because they're almost priced out of Dynasty to begin with and they don't even know what they're really looking for because kind of there's there's no definitive item there. Yeah. But. Chrome and Sapphire, the way that that's broken down with, you know, Sapphire obviously being the premier brand, like the upgraded version of Chrome that's topped, has released in the past half decade. Um, and then Chrome having the, the autographs, albeit stickers, you have two different things that you can go for. So both products, you know, have different things working for them. But the thing is, people know what they're looking for, and there's enough out there that the, the general market can be driven to those. Yeah. So that's why I feel that Chrome... And uh, Sapphire would be the two that, down the line, you look back and say, okay, these are the ones. And again, choosing two out of three products, I'm not prognosticating some kind of crazy, crazy future here. <laughs> um, but, I, you know, we've had this discussion on the Discord channel and a couple of other places, too. Um, I, I think the general public will, will lean Chrome and, uh, Sapphire. and, and Sapphire. And that, that you're going to see, uh, you're going to see that reflected in the price. You already are starting to see it. Um, you know, we we talked about it on my stream for a long time. I was telling people for months, you know, just I know it's great to open right now. It's hard to lose. It's hard to do bad at, you know, six hundred dollars a box, six fifty a box, five yeah. fifty sometimes on Chrome. Um, it's hard to do terrible, but just buy the wax because it's it's going to dry up and it's going to go up. It, it, there was such an anomaly between the average return and the high end potential as opposed to the box price. It yeah. didn't. It didn't. And I'm honestly surprised that, that that little bubble that we got to work within lasted for for two and a half months. And yeah. so now you're going to see the trickle-down effect with the box price going up and the singles going up uh, in turn, which is going to cause the box price to jump again and until it gets to a point where everything levels off. Where yeah. that number is, I don't know. Um, but it's a, it, this, this scenario has played out in other sports and um, in other products before. So I, I've, I've seen this many times. Yeah, and... Um... So do you, like, I know on the Discord we kind of have this talk every once in a while, but, like, do you see this release as being, like, not nearly, like, to the level as, like, 12, 13 prison, but being one of those, like, iconic designs and brands for, like, the first release of something? Because, so, like, I think, like, I th like I don't think it's quite to that level, but, like, I thought, I think it's kind of similar to that that update that I mentioned. Like, not maybe not quite to that level, but, like, you can recognize it and know what you're looking for. It's so it's, that's a great question and it's, it's a difficult one to answer just because this design was this tops chrome design was used in, a, in baseball right exactly and oh, the baseball version of this it says wow that card I need to have that I know that that's 2020 tops chrome baseball and man do I need that yeah so it's hard to say because the other products that I mentioned uh, you know I think um, prison basketball is really the only other one that crossed over into another sport in the same year yeah um, they did hockey and football as well. But even those sets have taken off being the first prison set. Um, and yeah. people know that design. It doesn't matter what the set is. So um, I don't know if it'll wind up being an iconic design that everyone knows that this is the 2020 Topps Chrome design because of the F1 cards. Mm -hmm. But I know that people within this sect of the market will for sure know that when they see that card, that that's 2020 Chrome and 2020 Chrome Sapphire. Gotcha. Um, so that, that'll definitely happen. But the other thing to remember that, you know, I know we'll probably touch base on this a little later on, but I just want to throw it out there now, is that it's hard to figure out what's really a rookie card in these products. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I know you were mentioning not too long ago about how you feel one of your stronger plays out there is the some of the Tops Now cards, like Fernando Alonso's Tops Now card, and then the yeah. 2011 um, SI for Kids Sebastian Vettel. And then, you know, we have all these Lewis Hamilton cards from Futera and um, all these other off-brand sets from the mid-2000s. Like, stuff yeah. that, you know, predates are what we're looking at now by up to 15 years in, in some cases. Yeah. Um, 
But here we are treating it this like this is a rookie card for Lewis Hamilton or for Verstappen or for, for all these guys. So it's it's really hard to decipher long term where the market will will lean. Um, I would tell you that as far as the single side, a lot of the, the really smart investors will zag when everyone zigs. So when everyone's coming here to Chrome Sapphire, you might find a lot of the the more savvy people or uh, people that have had good success in this industry leaning towards some of those other cards, realizing that, you know, a 2007 Lewis Hamilton might be a better option than a 2020 version. But and it's way too early to tell. And that's always been my thing. Like, and what I want to do with this channel is I want to be like a cha- like I want to be able to like show people where to zig in- instead of zagging with the crowd. Like, like that's why I made like that sports illustrated for kids video for the Vettel. Like, for forty card. for like yeah for like for forty dollars to get ten sheets at four dollars a card like I can like no yeah like I'm not losing I'm not losing at four dollars a card especially when it has a LeBron James on the sheet and LeBron will sell anything for money. So I mean, if you want to just hook a brother up and send me one of those sheets for my compensation for this call, I mean, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I could, but the problem is, sent shipping those SI for kids out are a pain in my behind. I will I say. Can, I, I can hook you up with a couple dollar dollar bills. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's no, it's funny you said that because um I've had just because I'm uh, helping some family friends ship out some of their cards and uh, they have some uh, like 1990 sports later for kids. Yeah. And they're just a pain to ship because you're gonna have to cardboard each side, and yep. it's a it's a decent amount of cardboard for like that size sheet. And oh, then yeah. then you're gonna have to find like the right thing to fit it in like. Usually, like some legal paper document, you're gonna have to fit that into, and then yeah, ship it. Priority mail, like uh, like one of the flat cardboard, the flat rate cardboard ones. Yeah, it's like, just it's just a lot of work compared to me just like doing a bubble mailer with like tracking. Like I can do that in like thirty seconds. I'm on you, eBay. That's part, of, part of why cards are so good is it's the, that side of it, just shipping, just penny sleeve, top loader, team bag, bubble mailer, done in a minute. Yeah, they don't. Space. That's why people like gravitate towards cards instead of other collectibles. I've been saying that forever. Most people don't think about it because our cards take up so much space. Like my basement right now is a joke. Yeah. Thank God this is a video call. You think <laughs> I was like a hoarder, which I am, for the record. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, it's uh, I can only imagine if we were collecting stuff like if I was collecting like full size helmets or like you know, the, oh yeah, like higher rims, uh, whatever memorabilia F one dot com is offering right now. So. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna. Um... So since we're on the 2020 kind of boxes, I'm going to jump over to Dynasty. Yeah. yeah. And so my uh, main thing I wanted to talk about is um, – so first I wanted to say the people ripping this product for $3,500 are insane. I'm going to say that first of all. A lot of people out there with a lot more money than both of us where $3,500 is uh, you know $5 to us at the blackjack table. So <laughs> those are the kind of people ripping to the 3500 But I mean yeah, it's, it's, it's fair. I think – it's fair to say, but I think it's still in my mind. I'm all like, no matter how much a product costs, I'm always a risk versus reward. Like, if I put this money down, what what am I going to get back out of it? It's a tough one. I'd never open it. And when I look at like what I can get back, like, I th- what there's like thirty something cards in the checklist, I think. Mm-hmm. And like, what maybe like three of those get you your maybe. money back? Maybe. Yeah. And of, I mean, of those three, like, I mean, you probably still. I, I don't even know if every Russell or Norris will get you your money back. I don't even know. Yeah. If every, I don't know if you get like a, a, a one with a bad auto, like placed over the, the, the driver's face where they sign in a bad spot with really, really ho hum patches. Yeah. I don't even know if that'll cover your box cost. Yeah. And, Max Lewis bucks. and the thing is, is like, and I'm like for a Max Lewis, you could, you could pull a Lewis auto, but guess what? You pulled the duel with, with Bottas and there kills some of your value right there. Yeah. Getting Albon on the card. It's, yeah. I mean, that's, Think about that. The, I don't think I don't even know. It's probably right around the same price at this point. The uh, the Max Albon duel. Probably I think the cards are like thirty five hundred bucks, four grand maybe right now on the high side. Probably. And I don't even want that. I don't want an Albon. <laughs> I would sell that if I got it. Cause I don't want it. And that's that was that was gonna be my exact point. Like I was I was like thinking like if there was like a guy you like that like if you have to have Dynasty for the high end like go for the duel if they're on a duel because like. There was honestly only one duel that I saw that I thought could be worth it, and that duel was the um, Vettel Leclerc because I could see that being like a good one for the future. Yep, I mean, but, that's, that's great. That's the only one that I have on there too. But then um, every but every other one I saw like, like yeah. I'm. I think, well, 
right? Signs Norris is one. Yeah, I believe so. That's that's the other one that I thought was decent. I wouldn't say that one was as good, but that one was okay. I mean, and you got to remember, I mean, Mercedes is still going to be good. Botas is still what a nine-time winner. Uh, yeah, you know that probably like twenty-fifth all time in, in race wins or wherever. So, I mean, I know we like to give him crap, but I feel like that's. If he was not on Mercedes, right, if he did the same thing on a different team, we'd be like, oh, he's, he's nice. We'd look at him in the same light that we'd probably look at, like, you know, Checo or someone like that. Yeah, so. Exactly, because if, like, let's say, like, he's, let's say he was on, he stayed with Williams his whole career and he got the nine wins. You're yeah. looking at him, like, and, like, oh, he's a, he's a wheel man. He knows how he can drive a car. Yeah, you know, that guy, you know, he's, he's doing work over there and, uh, or good for him. Yeah, exactly. You know? So, but so, yeah, it's, not, it's just it's just a really tough product overall. I mean, that's that's one where if you get your hands on some of that, I mean, you know, I I couldn't I couldn't be more adamant than telling you or telling you to keep it sealed. I, I, there's probably nothing on this call that you should take away more than if you have Dynasty, don't open it. Just keep it. Because <laughs> I remember so. there was I saw like people aren't really even opening anymore because of the price point. I saw one guy open open a box. He he committed to it. And he pulled the surreal circle auto that sold for like seventy five dollars. So bad. And like, like that year, like, cause like at least like if I open like a chrome and sapphire box myself, like for a thousand bucks, I could have a bad box, but at least I could maybe get twenty five percent of my money back at least. Yeah, you got inserts, you got parallels, you got some base cars. Maybe you can work and put together a set of something or exactly. whatever. Exactly. That there's value to be had there. In Dynasty, it's it's just it's a blind dart throw. So yeah. it's it's tough. It's Dynasty is a very very different part of even the baseball market, which is already very well established with all these different products. It's still like its own unique section in, in that market. I mean, yeah. Imagine you don't have to imagine. I mean, you can see how you know divisive Dynasty is um, in the F one market between the people that talk about it. Some yeah. people swear by it. it's going to be it that that is the greatest play. And then you have other people with like us that are more value minded and look aesthetically and all that stuff um, outside of you know more than just the initial price point and how many boxes were made. And we, I couldn't stay far enough away. At this point, you know, oh yeah, I had to keep it sealed. No, yeah, I couldn't. I wouldn't touch it with a blind stick. I would only like I would. I'll buy singles. Like I think buying the singles are fine, but I, <laughs> buying a box is just yeah, can't do it. Can't do it. All right, and now uh, with that, I'm gonna jump to. Uh, the product that hasn't released, uh, 2021 Tops Formula One. Yeah. I did a, a video kind of covering this recently, and I wanted to kind of hear your opinions on this product at the price point of like 500 a box. Because I because I know you're like I have the one mind, and I can kind of be like, maybe I maybe I'm just pessimistic at the price at 500 dollars. But I wanted to kind of hear where you were at for where it's where it's going. Um. So we got a couple things to think about here. Um. It's going to be one impossible to judge the product without knowing two things. One is the checklist, and I guess two things is probably three things. Is the print running is their retail, uh, yeah. but those kind of yeah. so got to remember this is paper. Paper yeah. twenty one F one is coming out at a higher price than what twenty twenty Chrome came out at. Exactly. So, common sense tells you that yeah, I know F one's hot right now. Um, and again, you know, I, I hope this comes off as genuine as I mean it as someone who literally my job is I work for a company who sells you these boxes at these prices. Right. And, um, I think it's terrible. I think it's bad. It's yeah. bad. I, I can't, I can't, I can't foresee a scenario where 2021 F1 paper returns that kind of value, especially because we know they're going to release a Chrome version and a Sapphire version later in the year. Exactly. You know that that's, um, so it might be good in the short term. There's plenty of products that do that, especially um, depending on the uh, the checklist that I mentioned earlier. We don't know what we're going to be looking at. Like, are we going to be looking at rookie card logos for drivers that were F2 drivers in 2020 yeah. that get bumped and become F1 rookies? Or, so are we going to see a rookie card logo there? Are they going to be able to uh, move down the, the line and get into F3 and, say, get someone like Piastri in a car, uh, on a card? Is he going to have a rookie card logo on an F3 card? Are they going to start, like, I don't really know where, how it's going to shake out because, you know, this year's product was so so confusing as far as what they did with determining what is a rookie, at least in their mind, for for 2020. Yeah. Um, the secondary part kind of decided. It's the driver subset, which was obvious. But um, I think we're looking at all of the F2 cards as rookies as well, even though most of them haven't, haven't hit an F1 car yet. 
But is that trend going to continue? Is that going to be the card to have once some of those uh, F2 drivers matriculate into F1? Yeah. I, I, don't know. I really don't know. Um, especially if Top, top starts using rookie card logos for when they become F1 drivers. It's, mm-hmm. um, it's still a lot of things to, to shake out. But to the original question, uh, I, I got to imagine it's going to be real tough. I can't, I can't foresee see there being on-card autos in, in F1 paper. I would assume any autos in there are going to be stickers. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if we see some memorabilia, though, uh, some sheet metal, some tires. Um, I would love, I would love suits. I don't know if we're going to get that uh, in paper. Um, so I know they don't use a ton of suits to begin with, but yeah. there's a lot, a lot of stuff that we don't really know. So I, I don't want to tell you definitively, but my initial, my initial thoughts based on 2020, 2020 pricing, uh, the use of the rookie card logos, uh, having the F2 drivers already in 2020. Um, cause you know, we're not going to see, we're not going to see an F3 driver bump up to F1. That's probably not going to happen. No. I mean, unless, so, unless someone goes after Piastri, um, you know, which you, you never know. I mean, stuff happens that comes out of left field all the time. I, I realize in this industry, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting. I, I think the secondary market will be real strong at first because people will be, um, trying to dive into, getting cards that of drivers that they couldn't afford because they're too late to the game and for the 2020 products here. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't, I don't see that as a long-term play at all. That's a, uh, that might be a short-term gain, um, for gotcha. anyone who go that route, but it'll at least be fun to have a new product on the table to, you know, to look at, to get through, maybe get some new, uh, new images. Um, I know they teased some of the images from the, the most recent photo shoot with Vettel's sitting down in the Aston Martin, um, so that's, that's, what's interesting to me about the paper. Okay. So I can answer some of your questions. I can answer. Cause I actually looked into a lot of the stuff you're asking. Yeah, go for it. please. Okay. So, um, so I don't know if you've seen, there are a few, I'll actually send them to you on dis- through discord so I can kind of get your reaction. Cause I have some pictures. Yeah. So like, I'll send you like this one The um, this was, um, I don't know where somebody <laughs> found this, but this is, <laughs> You can take your time getting there. I just I have it open on my computer. Just go, go ahead, you can send them over now. Yeah, I just sent I sent one over. So it's um it's it's a Mick Schumacher in the house, and he has the rookie card logo. So, which means that like Mick and Yuki and Maze Maze Pin will all have their rookie card logo, like the rookie card emblem. It's interesting that they also have the freshest logo on there too, and the rookie card logo. They put both of them on there. So that's kind of. That's kind of interesting. I yeah. did see that. I thought I, I thought I saw someone said somewhere that that was. Um, a mock-up uh, of something that well, I don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, yeah, I've, I'm not sure. Like from from what I heard, somebody said these were like taken directly from somewhere. That could be wrong. But, okay, I I thought I read that it was a mock-up that they were using um, because they didn't know if they were going to get 2020 Chrome out on time. Um, so okay, also, that's fair. All right, so well, I'll. We'll, I mean, I don't know if that's true, though. So. Okay, well, I'll keep that with a grain of mind. Um, the other things I do know are um, I'm sending you this screenshot that was taken. Yeah, let's see. Um, this was taken from, hopefully it's sent, from Walmart's website. Um, so so I'm guessing they're going to come out with some, there's coming out with a retail. I don't, I'm going to assume a value is going to be like a blaster. Uh, so, no, uh, so for tops, top would call it a, a blaster box. A value box is usually more like a. Um, Are those like hanger hanger boxes? It's, it's like the equivalent of a hanger box. Okay. A value box. Um, it's interesting to see the price point though at nineteen ninety eight because the hangers, those hanger boxes, ten bucks, right? Um, they're usually a little bit cheaper. They're usually no higher than like fourteen ninety nine. Yeah. Uh, so again, it really is going to depend on the content. I don't. I don't know what exactly what it's going to contain. But no, it was more. Yeah. It was more to show that like there is like a decent shot that it comes to retail. I think was what I was trying to go for that. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, if that's on there, someone—that's an actual like, legitimate screenshot. Um, I took yeah. that. I took that from my own phone, so I know for a fact like that was on. And yeah. then so, the last—the last thing to answer your question from this product, um, when I was looking there, uh, no mention of any autos. So the thought process is that it's only relics for this product. Also, the way Topps paper has worked in the past in baseball, it's always been a relic or an auto per box, um, and. I would say over the course of the case, you know, you're looking at maybe two to three autos total. Would um, that's so, which is why like like they made on the the like the checklist site like even the site said like 
there was no mention of any autos being included, only relics. Okay. So like as so, of yeah. like so like technically as of this moment, like we don't like we don't think there's any autos in it. <laughs> like that could change. Yeah. Like ob- that could obviously change, and like that would change yeah. things. But if there's no autos in this product, like hard pass, immediate pass for me, unless there's like I said, unless they start delving down into the uh, the F two and the F three ranks, and yeah. so you're gonna be first option to get like you know your first like cards of some of those guys. Yeah, and that's. Like, I assumed, like, they're going to kind of dip into the F2 like they did this year. Like, I feel like that was a fair assumption because they did it this I, year. I, I think F2 will obviously be back because, you know, they did it in the first year. They're going to do it again in the second year. They have to fill out a, a set of cards somehow. I mean, there's only you know, 20 drivers. you got a couple principles. I mean, you you got to use something, right? And um, Yeah, so, like, that's why I said, like, I said, like, the biggest thing for this product, honestly, is probably going to be, like, because, like, in F2, you could get the Piastri, the Porsche, like, all those guys, like, for their first kind yeah. of cards, that 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 would be the saving grace for the product, the price point. It's um, and again, I don't even know if that'll help because five hundred dollars for paper, I'm still staying away. Yeah, hundred um, percent. I'll wait. I'll wait. Pro, but yeah. um, you know, that'll be that'll be the thing that probably could save or help this product, the price point, that in autos. Um, but again, don't know and don't know. This you got to remember too that this is going to be the other like first like. I would say mainstream product that Tops puts out for F1. Yeah. People that want to get into it that are just like, I can't do this right now because I like Max or I like Lewis and I'm not paying, you know, this absorbent amount to get a base card. You know, I'm not paying hundreds of dollars to get a base card. Um, this will be what they, they choose. They'll be happy to, to get a box of this and, you know, get 360 cards in a box probably and pull every put together a full base set maybe two of them who knows you know yeah. close to two and all these inserts and all this content um i'm sure there's going to be a section of the market that's very happy to have that so oh like it, yeah like if like if it comes to if it get ends up going to retail like i want to just get as money like as much retail as i can like because for like i feel like there's more value there than a 500 hundred dollar box if i could get a blaster for i mean tops keeps bumping blaster prices up but if you could get it for the 30 dollars that tops chrome is like I would much rather get like, th- 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 let's say I got ten blasters and I'm still like almost like just a little over half the price of a hobby. Yeah, sign me up. Yeah, exactly. I'm in. I agree with you because especially if there's no if there's no like hobby exclusive things to chase, you know, if we have no autos and all we're chasing is tire relics, I that's not what I'm in for. I'm not in for the tires. I mean, they're nice, but be cool. But uh, that's not what I'm. I'm not in yeah. five hundred dollar boxes for uh, for that. You know, I'm in it for the rookies uh, and for the the big names and the autos. So. Yeah. Everyone's so, different, so that's the thing. It'll be interesting to see how um, everyone else reacts because, you know, everyone's not like me or not like you or the rest of us. We all collect in our own way. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. It'll so, be interesting. I, so, yeah. I'm excited for it. So, I think uh, kind of going off of that, I was curious on uh, your thoughts because you're, you're the guy who deals with all these, like, like all products. Like, you, like you deal with basketball, football, all this yeah. stuff. And I want to do, like, curious, like, on, like, like, maybe just an average like break like a breaking day how much interest do you see with f1 compared to like i'm obviously gonna assume you get basketball and football as your top but like if you had to make like a percentage where do you think like those percentages will fall with those respective sports so the interest level and what i sell are going to be wildly different numbers um that's fair down to price points uh basketball is almost too expensive for most people to price it's hard for me to even carry a lot of those items um and especially when there's not a lot of packs, there's no way to break it down. And it's hard for me to do them in group rates because, you know, again, because the price point, people get killed. And I don't like that. I, I don't ever want to see that. I don't ever want to, you know, recommend stuff where there's not, there's not at least good value. Gotcha. Um, or chance to get something good. Like there has to be something that I can be confident in saying to you that this is where you should spend your hard earned money. I'm not, I'm not in this to, you know, just. Oh, I want to open National Treasure. It's going to be fun for me, but it's going to be terrible for everyone that spends their money on <laughs> Yeah, it. as everybody like, gets killed on the National Treasure box. Yeah, so I mean, that's that's the opposite of what I want. I want nothing to do with that. I want I want everyone to do well and to buy the right products. So, I mean, basketball is, without a doubt, the you know the sport that has the most interest. But for me, it has the least interest because and the products are just too difficult, right? Uh, but base, baseball is probably the one that uh, is my best because there's enough products, the right price points. Uh, the players stick around for a long time. Uh, yeah. It's not like football where, you know, you have these guys who are pro bowlers one year and then out of the league the next because they've torn all seven of their ACLs 
uh, and ruptured six of their Achilles. <laughs> so, you know, it's baseball's the one. Uh, but racing, man, I, dude, I can't even tell you how much during that two month stretch or maybe two, two and a half months where people started really started realizing that F1 cars were kind of good and that yeah. F1 was exciting to watch and that there was all this, this, you know, buzz starting to build before the box prices jump. Man, we had days where we would open 15 boxes of Sapphire and eight boxes of Chrome <laughs> and you know, just, just boom, just one after another. Just I had just stacks and stacks and stacks of all this stuff everywhere. Like I couldn't keep it in stock, yeah. and it was it was part of that uh, that fun time in the hobby where um, when Tops does something with like Sapphire, so right, that's a direct to consumer item yeah. where it comes out on Tops' website, so everyone gets a little bit of it. So it's very hard for the market to go up in price because there's so many different sellers that are willing to take whatever profit they can get, right? Because you buy the box for. 200 on top's website yeah. or 240 or especially if you're like a member of montgomery club where you get like every box so like correct it's you have all these different sellers that you know they don't they don't they don't have five thousand boxes of f1 sapphire like you know some distributors will for other products where they need to make sure that the market kind of stays level when everyone has two boxes or one boxes you have all these boxes changing hand between people and the type of commodity changes it's almost more like a single at that point at that point where you know what? It might have been six hundred, but you know some people are willing to let it go at five eighty because they don't care. They're making four hundred bucks off their two hundred dollar purchase, so they don't care if they don't they don't max out at you know the highest sale. And then it'll happen again. It'll keep happening until all those boxes, all these individual boxes or two off boxes that went out to thousands of different people, they're finally gone. And then once the market gets consolidated, um, whether those boxes are now all opened or you know. A lot of them get sold to places like us, like the Blowout or Dave and Adams, you know, Steel City. We're always buying products like this on the secondary market from people who have them. Yeah. Um, but once once that wave of, you know, the Joe public doesn't have those items anymore, that's when you see the supply dries up and you start to see the, the price going up. So it was great, though, for that two months where that supply was still out there for everyone and none of the, uh, the larger retailers, ourselves included, wanted to lose market share. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's a... Business 101, don't don't lose market share. So we were still at the same price point that they were going for, that they were readily available for. So I've never seen more interest in a, in a singular product that never that didn't change in pricing outside of, you know, been a, maybe a little bit like $100 a box, which is a drop yeah. in the bucket, all yeah. things considered. Now, you know, that any product can switch that, that amount in any day. Um, but, you know, that two months, man, it was awesome. So many people, do you have F1? Do you have F1? Do you have F1? Do you have F1? And then just watching us open F1, they were like, I don't even watch F1, but this is crazy. I looked up what those cards sold for. And, you know, every box has something like that. Like, I want one. I want one. I want one. It was it was amazing. Obviously, it has weaned a little bit now because yeah. um, at $1,200 a box for Sapphire, um, which I finally got some back in stock here, so I actually sold one. Oh, nice. uh, I didn't know it happened. I sold one um, at $1,250. So, um, and the day before that, we were selling packs. I think at one fifty or one one sixty. Oh yeah. Uh, it's the demand is still there. It's still there. It's just um you know again I think we we've kind of gotten to the price point in twenty twenty one where um maybe some of the more casual people can't go the route of opening the sealed product anymore, which is good for everyone that's holding sealed product because I don't think anyone wants to let this stuff go. No, I don't think so either. Like it's just like if you can get your hands on it like nobody wants to get rid of it like and that's the same with singles like you see all these high-end singles drying up like if people are trying to yeah. buy all these high-end autos like people are everywhere hey do you have what high-end f1 do you have like i can't find it anywhere so the second yeah. it goes the second like it goes up on ebay like it's selling for premiums like and my perfect example of this is um since i have like the orange leclerc i kind of every once in a while open tabs to kind of see where it's at and like yeah. there is like like there was a there was a, quite a decent amount of oranges up there, but with the variation in the regular, then like there was I think I checked like maybe last week, they just all they're all dried up. Like there was like one image variation did eight hundred dollars. I know. I have one sitting on my desk, and I was gonna buy it, and I told the person I said, "Hey, um, the sapphire orange image variation sitting literally sitting on my desk." And yeah. I said, "Hey." The last two only did like four hundred and like five, a little over five hundred. They were yep. like in the four fifty five, 
And I said, I feel like that's a little bit low. But yeah. there's one up for auction right now. I just want to see what it ends for so I do, I, you know, I can make a fair offer for you. Yep, and, and that's the one that went crazy. I wanted to buy it right on the spot for 400 bucks because he would have sold it. But I was like, listen, like, this just doesn't feel right to me in the market right now. Let's see what happens for both of us. Yeah. And it went for over $800. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, that sounds, that sounds more more correct for what I would have expected for that card. But that's the thing is, like, people move on from one driver to the next. It was, you know, it was Lewis at first to start, and then the Lewis stuff dropped because it was so it was so hot. Yeah. Right? And everyone jumped on Max. And then when Max completely dried up, then everyone jumped on, like, Lando for a little bit. And then with the speculation on um, Russell going to Mercedes, everyone jumped on Russell. And I Russell still think, and, I, and the thing is, like, cool. I still think it's a lot on Russell. Like, I think, like, he's the hottest guy right now. Yeah, but I think like people, people, I think people think that the change, the announcement, is going to make the prices go up. But the price already went up. <laughs> okay, this is something. This is one of the main <laughs> topics I wanted to talk to you about, and this will probably be an echo chamber thing. But people like in the Discord and people online are saying, "Oh, I'm going to hold Russell till he signs a Mercedes, and then I will sell everything." But people don't understand this happens all the time in the other sports. Like, like, ba- like I always say the Hall of Fame announcements. Everybody says to buy for a Hall of Fame announcement. But so guess what? 500 other people did the exact same thing. And you're supposed to sell it like the week before they actually go to the Hall of Fame. Because once, well, once he gets in, that card's plummeting because everybody's listing a card. Yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a great concept. And um, the Hall of Fame example actually brings me to another point. point. Uh, and I'll get back to the Hall of Fame one in just a second. There's, yeah. there's two things like that that people do. The Hall of Fame is one, and that is such a bad idea. Yeah, right? I, yes, because I agree. Players, players that are making the Hall of Fame, like you don't, you don't think that you know everyone knows that, like you know, Kobe Bryant's going, going was going to the Hall of Fame. Yes. Do you think it's hard for him to go up when they made that announcement? Like it's some big shocker. You yeah. know, it's not. Things like that are not. They're. They're no. They're already no. Like that. It's a. It's a silly play. Yeah. Um, but then you have what's going on right now with George Russell. Right. So racing's a little bit different, but we see this kind of concept in other sports where you can kind of see the potential in a player, right? Are you like I wanna a quick question? Giannis. Giannis is a great one. I was gonna Go say ahead. I have a quick question for you. Yeah. So I'm 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 gonna try to guess where you're going with this and you can tell me if I'm wrong. I wanted to make a guess. Okay. Go ahead. And I wanted to see if you're going if you're gonna take the guess like if somebody like I'm gonna use a random basketball example. Let's say, um, so we know Damian Lillard was hyped up a couple months ago because he wasn't assigned to X team or whatever. Mm-hmm. If he actually were to sign to that X team, then, but everybody knew that he was already going there. And then the prices dropped because of that. That's where I was curious if that's where you were going to go with, with your example where like, if everybody yeah. knows the trade destination. Yeah, it's, it's, you have value when people expect something to happen and prices change because of an expected change or an expected result, that value is already baked in whether that outcome actually occurs or not. Yeah. And the one that I just I was just about to say before uh, – before, um, I interrupted you. Up, you. No, yeah, no, you're fine. You're good. Was, uh, was Giannis, right? For years now, people have said, Giannis, he's going to win MVPs. He's going to win championships. And when he wins those MVPs and championships, I'm going to sell my Giannis cards. But the thing is, his cards were already priced as if he won. Three yeah. MVP, three championships, you know? So when he finally does win that MVP or did win his back-to-back MVPs and did win that championship, everyone said, all right, this is it. I got to sell my Giannis. He did what we knew what we, he was, we were going to – like, we, he did what we knew he was going to do. Yeah. And it's time to sell. But literally everyone put their Giannis on the market, and they flood the market because, again, this is where zigging and zagging is, is important. And when you buy into someone with the plan of selling – based on expectation, if everyone else is doing the same thing, it's almost never going to work out for you. I mean, there's rare instances where, yeah, you know, someone does something way better or way more than you could have ever possibly expected. But whatever that person is that people are buying into, uh, it, it's usually the wrong play. It's, it's almost always the wrong play. And that's it's, we've almost reached that point right now with Max. Yeah, You know, I, I can tell you, I know the last – the last known sale out there on a Hamilton Orange Auto was ten thousand dollars, right? Yep. And there was almost a sale for a Max, the same card at the same exact price. 
it can't be the same price. That's nuts. That's yeah, crazy. Yeah, it can't be. But that's the thing. It's like, okay, if the, if the Lewis Orange is a $10,000 card, which I think that's probably might be a touch light right now for what that card is actually it, worth. That's at, least in the, that's at least in the ballpark, I would say. Maybe yeah, going up to there. 13 maybe 15 but it's some. It's close. Yeah, it's close enough. The point is it's close enough. What does Max have to do to make his card go up if it's already at the same price as the most accomplished driver in the history of Formula One? What does he have to do? <laughs> yeah. And how long is that going to take? You know? Are people going to hold their Max cards for, you know, 14 years so they can say, you know what? This is a good investment. I did it. <laughs> Wait 14 years. Max is the goat. Now I got 15. Crushed <laughs> it. What, what are you doing? Yeah. So, it, but the thing is, backing up from what I just said, like, you know, I know that was a little bit of hyperbole in there. Backing up from that is that at the same point, when people do more than what you would expect and it's going on right now, that's what kind of fuels like the frenzy, right? Like if, yeah. if Max wins five races in a row or six races in a row, or, you know, wins wins the championship this year and next year, and then by the, the end of his age 25 season, he's got, you know, 40 wins. He's the fourth most accomplished driver in F1 history with two championships under his belt. Then we start looking at what kind of trajectory is that? Mm-hmm. What if he drives until he's 38 years old like Lewis does? You know, can he win 10 world championships? Can he win 150 races? So that's the thing, and it's like it, it's, a, it's a really interesting dynamic between – Prices now, what kind of expectation is baked into those prices for the popular players that a lot of people are popular drivers that people are spending money on? And then what realistically needs to happen? Does that player have to do to see an increase? So it's, I mean, like I said, I I know I've told you this a million times that I could talk about every little detail in the market forever. Yeah. uh, Because I've been doing it for so long, so many hours a day. Uh, at the high, the highest level, you know, with the with the largest card company out there, that you know, it's all it's all fascinating to me, and it's it's all so so interesting. But it's crazy to see how quickly that particular baked in pricing uh, transferred over to F one because it doesn't it doesn't usually happen like that. Usually, people are cautious enough before they start throwing around thousands and thousands of dollars and ha- getting those that that baked in value um, that. It, it happened in F1 in a month, in a yeah. month and a half, just like that. You know, it, it started off with Lewis, and Lewis dropped, and everyone said, well, look how high Lewis is. And this is what I was telling people, and it was right. Look how high Lewis is, and look how low Max is. How is Max, you know, uh, for a couple hundred dollars, for it was $150 for his base card, and Lewis was over, was like 1300 when it came out in Sapphire. Yeah. Like, that's not right. A 10, 10 times markup for Lewis, that's insane. And then the gap kept shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and shrinking until it got to a point where it's too the correct was true. Yeah, it was an overcorrection. Then the correct, the opposite became true, uh, where you know you had Lewis Aquas going for like a thousand dollars and Max Aquas were like seven hundred. <laughs> That's not right either. So it's it's uh, it's it's really interesting stuff. But I'm I'm just excited, to honestly, to have racing back. Yeah. Uh, this week. So, so now I think this will be a fun thing. I'm gonna. I'm gonna go over my selling, what I because I want to go over what I want to do with this orange Charles, and I want to see if what you th- if you think my thought process is correct or not. Okay, go for it. So tell me what you tell me what you would do, and then I will tell you my thoughts on Charles and what I would do. So I, I'm I'm probably gonna be owner of the same exact card as you in, in about a couple of days. So so this will be interesting. Yeah. So like I feel like I've mentioned this to a bunch of people, but like even right now I still like okay with the, without this orange sale because like. There still isn't a lot of high end Charles. Like I've always said, he was undervalued at that four hundred dollar mark for sure. So I jumped. So I jumped in and bought him. I got it graded by PSA, so it's a PSA eight. And like right now, like I think it's fair to say Charles doesn't have like the hype that the Russell and the Lando does right now. So my whole thought process right now is let's wait until. My main thing is Ferrari said they're bringing the new power unit. So I'm thinking, hmm, they're bringing the new power unit in a couple weeks. If I get to just a few weeks from now, I'll probably even sell before the first race of their new power unit just when he's so hyped. So that's that's a great plan. That's a great plan uh, because usually you want to sell at the hype if there is hype uh, yeah. and not buy at the hype. That's usually the right play. Again, zigging and zagging. Uh, that's usually the right place. Sell at the hype. And then buy back when people move on to something else because then they'll be selling those items that, you know, they couldn't live without 
when the, the hype was happening. Yep. But for Charles specifically, um, it's, it's again, the, the very unique dynamic in F1 where it's not always just the driver. It's the car. The team, yeah. Uh, you have all these other people involved in the outcome of of his races and stuff, and literally stuff that he can't even control. You know, tire blowouts, you know, bad weather, getting crashed into by the boatman, which who ironically can't can't handle his boat in, in wet conditions. Yeah. Very strange. <laughs> The boatman can't handle the water. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you have all that stuff that, again, has such an impact on how he's going to be remembered. Um, that you look at him right now, right? He's 20, what is he, 20? I think this is eight, he's 23 right now. Uh, he turns 24 in 2021. I don't know if his birthday has passed yet. I'm not sure. But um, he signed a five year deal with Ferrari, right? And yeah. when you think about that, that was the lar- our longest contract ever. Ferrari, for yeah, ever. Ferrari never does that. Yeah, no one does that. So that's a huge contract for such a young young driver, and he's going to be married to Ferrari for a long time. Now, Ferrari can't put if they can't return to you know the days of Ferrari owning the most uh, the most F one World Championships uh, for a for a team. If they can't return to that level of car, what does that mean for Charles Leclerc? Yeah, you know, um, good driver, bad driver is winning one or two races a year, good enough to make him important to people when you have. These guys in the more competitive cars winning five, six, seven races a year, you know, and then you always have new drivers taking those second seats from those teams while he's just still at Ferrari. Yeah. So it, it's hard to say, but what I would do to go back to your original question, what I would do with Leclerc is, um, I, if, if I was into the card for the four hundred dollar range and now it's an eight hundred dollar range. I think that that money would be better invested somewhere else. Well, I can um, I can tell you I can tell uh, you that I'm uh, in the card because well it's hard for me because I did partial trade partial cash so at that point it gets kind of weird. But like my val like all things considered I probably got into the card for we'll say around seven hundred bucks. Yeah, so seven hundred bucks. I mean, those cards were going for way more than that when the product released. He was one of the hottest names. Yeah. Um, you know, that card was that card was a thousand bucks, no problem, when the product released and, and during those first couple weeks. Um, so even at seven hundred dollars, you know, I feel like it again, we I mentioned it before with overcorrections and stuff like that, and people just all trying to buy the same thing that it drops prices on other stuff. Um zigging and zagging, I'll say that probably a hundred times in the rest of this uh this call. Oh, I love but, saying it. Yeah. <laughs> um but you know, I don't know if the power unit is gonna save them, you know. And I, I don't I don't know if being I mean, I, I don't, I don't think he's going to beat Lando for the best of the rest. I mean, Lando, I think is your pretty much clear cut, runaway dead favorite for third in the constructors championship, uh, for the driver for the drivers championship. Excuse me. Yeah. Uh, so what's what's his best outcome? Is he right now? He I think he's dead tied with um, with signs and points, uh, but still behind uh, Checo and um, the boatman and Botas. So what what do they say? Six seven right now? Probably. Yeah. So, like, what does that what does that mean for him? If, you know, okay, even if he feels sneaks a win out this year, has a good qualifying, you know, here and there, wins a sprint race, whatever you want to call it, what, is, is one or two wins really going to get people excited? You know, for yeah. his future, if that car just is a fourth or fifth best car on the on the grid, fourth fastest car, I, I don't know. I really don't know. So again, that's where I say, you know, it's 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 hard when there's only twenty drivers to be ahead of the curve. Um, but I don't know if, uh, if, if, if Leclerc sees a spike, I think I'm, I'm moving on from it now and trying to find something else. Um, and then maybe, maybe delving back into Leclerc, um, at a different point. Cause I, I think the same might happen with Lando too. If, um, yeah. if him being so popular right now, if he stays with McLaren again, even for next year, right. And again, only just can't, can't crack the top two, mm-hmm. um, the same thing might happen. People will be like, all right, well, he's not winning enough races. He's, you know, the car is not good enough. You know, they might move on to whoever the next, the next name is next year. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know if that opportunity is going to happen with Lando. It might. Um, but Lando, the guys that, that don't win races it was for no fault of their own, just because I mean, it's hard to win a race if you're not in a Mercedes or a Red Bull right now. Yeah. Um, you know, those guys, when you see price increases on guys like that, and there's probably, I don't know, is there a realistic way to get any of those guys to Mercedes or Red Bull? Yeah, there's always a way. Is it going to happen? I don't know. 
Uh, but when you see those price increases, I think it's probably a good a good call to, to, to move on and then just keep looking for deals. There's always going to be deals somewhere. So that's that's my advice yeah. on the market for you, at least with, with guys that are in that type of uh, – in that type of tier as Leclerc. I, I don't really know how I feel about Lando yet. I, I mean, I just, I, I just bought a nice Lando, a real good Lando to make sure that I have one. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think everyone can recognize the talent, but it's, it's hard to pay what I paid for my Lando and knowing at the same time, well, well, damn, what kind of, what kind of Hamilton or what kind of Max could I have died? You know? Yeah. So it's, Again, just it's such such a very unique dynamic in, in F one with only twenty drivers, such low turnover, uh, people that have no chance, no matter how good of a driver they are, because the car is not not good enough. Uh, so many factors out of their control. It's it's just it's all so interesting. That's what makes F one so fascinating. Well, I'm gonna put this thought process about it since we're talking about doing stuff when nobody's doing it. I think um, this this might be a very hot take. <laughs> I love it. I'm I, hot take. I love an F one hot take. I think that um, this, and you might have to sit on this investment for a while, but I think by next year, if you buy a lot of Danny Rick stuff now, I think by next year when they get the brand new car that's not driving like this one, there is a good shot that he could outdrive Lando. I mean, you got to remember Danny. Ricardo, again, he's another multiple race winner. And that's why I'm saying that. I think the talent is there. I think he's struggling with a new car. And people forget that he the same thing happened to him with Renault his first year. He struggled yeah. his first year at Renault. It's so poor at Renault. I mean, again, there was a lot of there was a lot of bad luck uh, for Ricardo even from the start of that season. His first race, uh, I think they had an engine blow up. I think he had a couple of engines blow out. Yeah, he got hit a couple. I get a lot of bad luck. I felt like with Renault, but again, that's that's what happens when you put yourself into the middle of the pack in an inferior car when you're coming out of turn one in you know that four, five, six, seven spot where everyone's just trying to. To move up two positions, that that's going to happen. Yep. Um, but I think Danny Rick is a is a good play. He's also popular too. You know, he's again from Drive to Survive. He's he's a character. People yeah. like him. So he's to me, he's kind of in the same boat as the Boatman. You know, this multiple time race winner. Um, you know, if all goes well, you never know. Like these cars are going to be completely different next year with uh, how they're changing the understeer and the downforce. Yeah, that's what I'm so, saying. You don't know. You don't know how people are going to react to that. I mean, it's, yeah, it's still a race car uh, at the end of the day, but, you know, someone, there's probably one of the drivers out there, impossible to know who it's going to be and what or what team it's going to be. There's going to be someone out there that's going to surprise you. So, yep. uh, for, for better or worse, you don't know which way. You know, someone might just not be able to figure out how to drive that car correctly. Uh, there might be someone who just, like, that's that's where they excel at, you know, is if they have a little bit more downforce, um, you know, they'll be able to take take turns at a higher rate than they were able to in the previous car, and it's just going to change everything, like for someone in, in an Aston Martin or an Alpine or, or whoever. You don't know who it's going to be. Um, so I think that's a, a good play. Uh, Danny Rick is a great call, actually, on on that, um, given his pedigree and his likability. Um, yeah. I have a hard time finding his stuff, though, at a reasonable price already, to be honest. I haven't, so, I ha- I haven't started checking for his stuff yet, but uh, these are, I'm just kind of like thinking out loud right now with you. And the other one, yeah. the other big one, like I've okay, I've already started doing this, but I think Seb and Aston Martin is just with how much money Stroll has to put into that team, if they nail it, Seb will be that the guy for their team. Well, I think you know just from seeing the stuff that I've been posting in Discord, I am all in on Sebastian Vettel. Yes. Um, already he's thirty four years old, right? He's a four-time world champion, four in a row, nonetheless. I think he's won like difficult. 50 races or something already. Like, I believe it's 53 races, third all time. Yeah. Um, so, I think he's one of only I think three drivers to win four consecutive world championships. Uh, it's not a lot. I think it was three. Yeah. Um, but you know, as someone I, I mean who owns as much battle as I do. Again, he's super underrated, so underrated. Yeah. Like, think about that in football. What if I told you, hey, you could have the third best quarterback of all time in football for the same price as, like, some Joe Schmo the idiot? Yeah. You know? Well, what? Okay, yeah. You know? Um, like, I played, I, what part did I pay more for? The uh, Guan Yu Zhou Aqua Sapphire or the Sebastian Vettel Aqua Sapphire? It was the show! Yeah. That's insane. <laughs> Nuts. Um, but. <laughs> You know, that's what we talk about with market anomalies that we were mentioning a little bit earlier. So, 
he's a great pawn, and I've been, I've been scooping up Vettel wherever I can uh, because there's no downside to Vettel. Vettel's career is already made. If he doesn't win another race ever, if he thinks yeah. and flames out, no pun intended, and you know, and after next year, and he wants to go on and pursue his career, which uh, of you know working with um, for equal rights and you know uh, global activism, uh, that that's great. Good yep, for him. That's great. Cards are never gonna hurt. Hell, if he goes and does that. They might even become more popular, yeah. you know. Um, so, yeah, you know, yeah, he's a great play. He's, he's a great call. He's he's where I've been putting all my money, to be honest. Um, that I I've been getting as much stuff as I can, while all the Maxes and Lewis has gotten too expensive, and even Lando and Russell in the past couple of weeks, I've been just nothing but Seb. So, and for those. Exactly. For those who haven't seen uh, his collection of Seb, if you if you're curious where that one of one Pop Padasha was, you can you can go message Buff on trying to buy it from him. I have it actually in my hand right now. I I may be kissing it. it... <laughs> yeah. So if, so if you want to go bother him to try to buy the Seb, he's the set. He's has a lot of Seb. I've almost got the full rainbow. I'm uh. I just need the red. I need the red. Yeah. The, got, it's funny how like. Like I don't, I feel like for some reason I see so many of the one hundred ones go for sale, but the reds like never go for sale for some reason for cards. I don't see the reds too often either, um, at least for the true drivers um, or the people that I keep an eye on. Um, but oh, it's fine, dude. I didn't even tell you. I didn't even know. So I bought the purple set. Yeah. I bought it on Discord for I think I, was, I don't even remember six, seven hundred bucks somewhere in that range. Mm -hmm. Cardinals, it was five of ten. I had oh, no sweet. Idea. Yeah, nice little bonus. Very, very surprised about that when I was uh, scanning my cards the other day. I flipped it over. I was like, "Oh well, shit, five of ten! Look at that, we did it finally." That's like there's um there's a guy. Have you seen the guy from the base series of Chroma trying to collect all of the out of fives? Yeah, yeah, I did. That guy was nuts. And then like he was like, I like how he was like, "Oh, I can't, I can't find the purple number to five. And then this random guy in the Discord, like th two or three days later, he's like, "Oh, check out my sweet card number, purple Seb." <laughs> yeah, that was. That was funny. I'm the one who told him. I was like, yo, bro, someone literally like 10 posts up just asked about this, this exact serial number of this exact card. And then there it was. <laughs> That's funny. That was, that, that was funny. Yeah, I, I felt bad though because I wanted to message you guys like, hey, you know, I have the uh, – I think it was Spurs sports cards. I think that's who it was. I wanted to mention like, dude, I have the, the metal purple sapphire 5 of 10. Yeah. And I'm so happy. I love that your collection, but you're never going to get this one. So just – just forget about it. <laughs> uh, the good thing he's not going for the, going for that yeah. sapphire set. That was like yeah. that was me. Like I pulled the um like in the break. I got a Drugovich out of five from F two. Yeah. And, and I was like, and it's like I was like I was like you know I was like I was like hmm, I wonder like like I didn't know what this would go like who knows what a random F two out of five goes for. So I was like, yeah. let's show try to check comps, and I go online and sure enough the one of one is just on sale on eBay. It's sitting there, right? Yeah. Like, like it was on auction, and I was like, mm, I was like, if this if this goes cheap, oh, I'll, I'll maybe scoop it up for a rainbow. Yeah, but like, something to do. Something, you more money or more things to waste your money on. Yeah, I know. I mean, I didn't end up buying it because like I couldn't bring myself to pay three hundred fifty dollars for a random F two. Oh, no chance. One of one, but like, not like, for Drogovich. Yeah, not for Drogovich. If it was like an I lot, maybe I'll take that chance, but like. I think he. I was actually reading an article about him the other day. He's uh, he's interesting. He says he's uh, really excited to be trying new things now in uh, in racing. He just. Uh, I think he podiumed at Le Mans. Um, okay, I think he did too. Yeah, pretty sure he did. Um, and he was saying he might go and do uh, uh, what's it called, uh, IndyCar or Sprint, uh, all these other things. He was saying as because I think he's the uh, the test he's the test driver for. Um, one team and then the reserve driver for another i can't remember i think it's alpha romeo i think yeah i think one of them was alpha but i don't know the second one yeah i'm just i'm just spacing out right now but um he was saying like doing all those different roles right now um uh, is opening so many like uh opportunities for him in f1 and then all these other places so he has no idea what he's going to wind up doing interesting. Uh, i thought it's interesting because i feel like a lot of these guys it's like f1 or bust like if uh, they'll just you know give anything for f1 and then last resort is to go somewhere else and he was just all like yeah, I might go ride dirt bikes. Uh, <laughs> I feel like the opposite of every driver I've ever heard talk. So, All right. guy. So I have one or two different uh, kind of points I wanted to kind of touch on. I don't think these are going to necessarily be your wheelhouse by any means. But uh, You'd be surprised. <laughs> okay, so um, 
one of the one of the things I've been really looking into are um, like notable notable names like notable names in sports that don't get a lot of card attention. Yeah. So oh, yeah. So like what I did like <laughs> like I mean NASCAR is probably the biggest one, but I buy up like I'm still trying to buy some Haley Deegan like bigger names. Like, I don't care if they do well or not; they'll always do well. And yeah, the, so. The, Okay, I'll get to the my big one. The yeah, big yeah. one the big one that I found right now, and I guess this is for the people who say the bombshell. I Hold think on, ready? let's do this, wait a second. At the same time, go we'll go one, two, three, because there's someone that I'm thinking of. All right. So we'll go one, two, three. I'll give you a hint. I'm just gonna tell you. Mine is not involved in racing. Oh, mine so, so I have I have two very good buys, one in racing, one non racing. Okay, we'll do non-racing at the same time. You count out. You count down. Wait, one, two, three, are we going for a certain like a certain like? Are I just going for the like the type of card it is? Like, am I going for like? Just say the person's name. Just one, two, three, and then we'll say the person's name. We'll see if we say the same. Person. Oh, there's no showers in the same name. Mine's very out there on ball. Well, let's do it. You never know. <laughs> All right. All right. One, two, three. King the Conqueror. Serena. Uh. <laughs> oh, Serena. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, so if you want to explain, if you want to explain yours first, I'll explain both of mine because I had two that I'm really looking at for non big sports. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, Serena, I, I don't even really think she needs explaining. Yeah, tennis I don't think you need to explain a ton cards. about it, but she gets like no cards. Um, I mean, tennis gets almost nothing. Uh, they had a transcendent set a couple of years ago. They have another one this year, but for the most part, she has nothing. Uh, probably the most dominant female tennis player of all time. Tennis, she, might be the, just, she might be the most dominant female athlete of all time. Yeah, could be. I mean, I don't know enough about track and field to say that they're swimming or stuff like that, yeah. but she's in conversation 100%. Um, but, I mean, tennis is, tennis is right there, right, with F1 as yep. one of the most popular sports in the world. I think it's actually probably the third, third most popular sport in the world. I'm pretty sure the rankings go soccer, basketball, tennis, golf, uh, surprisingly track and field as a whole but I mean there's so many different sections of that yeah. then it was F1 um, and then I think it was the NFL followed by uh, volleyball and uh, then some other random stuff but I think that was yeah. like the top eight on the list so that's that's my place Serena Williams she's got a rookie card in 2003 uh, something or other I can't remember the name of the set um, but that's, well, uh, that's to excite you, I just sent um, for the second time. I'm sending a 1999 Sports Illustrated for Kids Serena Williams. Oh, nice! As yeah. the first time I sent it, they flagged me for minimum size, like all other Sports Illustrated. Yeah. So I figured yeah, I will just keep sending it every time I submit stuff until they finally grade it. Because <laughs> I checked the minimum size and there was nothing wrong with the size. It's just the perforation, it's, so, the perforations. Yeah, I was gonna say uh, if, if people don't know what you're talking about, the Sports Illustrated for kids cards, they um, they come in a sheet where you fold them, uh, they're perforated on the edges, and you fold them almost like a ticket stub, and that's how they come apart. There's nine in the sheet, and uh, the way that they do the min size on those is they generally count the perforations, uh, but the thing is, not every card has always got the same amount of perforations on it, yeah. so there's a small like uh, amount of variance in there where um, I learned this from the Tiger Woods cards, I can't remember the exact amount, but they were people would be like, no, I pulled it out of the sheet and it has one less perforation. And that's because if the perforation falls perfectly, um, on a corner, have, yeah, the, the max, well, it's not on the corner. It's the opposite. Okay. It, it, would fall on, it would fall on the corners of the two cards around it oh. where the, but it has the max amount of space between the, the last perforation on your card to the edge on both sides. It winds up having one full perforation less on the card. So it looks like the card has been, been altered possibly um so it's it's a uh, again fun little thing but I, I think they've come to realize that that isn't always the case because if that was if that was the case you know you would see remnants of that last preparation there because that that last preparation if it's half a preparation or so that usually looks funky and it usually messes up the corner grade um, yeah. or what would be deemed to be the corner grade so that's why that they do that because a lot of people would just go ahead and um well people that do things like that that are the worst by the way anyway, yeah trans cards that's what they would go for they would go for those ones on the corners um interesting them off so yeah that's interesting to know because like mine like i um i do the very rudimentary i measure it compared to a standard card size yep 
So like, and I feel like that that's just like the easiest way for a judge. And like, like when I first, like I got it, like I got the grade back and I said min size. I was like, hmm, like maybe like I just like, cause I didn't check at the time. I was like, hey, yeah. maybe it is like, maybe it is off, but I checked and it's like the exact same size. It's just kind of unlucky. Yeah. It's, I, it's happened to me too. I mean, I've literally sent in cards like, uh, from like 2018 prism and like, you know, 2016 tops, whatever. And they just come back min size. I'm just like, it doesn't happen very often. You know, I've, I've sent tens of, Tens of thousands of cards are grading. Probably close to a hundred thousand cards in grading since like twenty eleven. Gotcha. Uh, and you know, I've gotten back maybe fifteen or twenty where they're like, you know, evidence of trimming or you know, mid size. I'm just like, I I have no idea. I got nothing. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. And just yep, it is what it is. It's gonna happen when you submit that many items. It's gonna happen eventually. Yeah. So. All right. So I'm gonna go my two non big things. I'll go for the sp- the sport the one that's actually in a sport first. The okay. one I didn't say. I really like buying Scott Dixon in IndyCar. You were mentioning him um, last night on the, the loop stream. So tell, tell me a little bit more about, about Scott Dixon. Okay, so Scott Dixon is an IndyCar driver, six-time champion of IndyCar. And I see when I see the big six-time champions of any sport, like that's my eyes just jump out to me. Yeah, 100%. And like, and like, like it's IndyCar. There's barely any cards for IndyCar in general. That was my next question: Is what is the uh, the IndyCar market? There's barely like? anything, so like, yeah, I, uh, and like, so like, there. I know he has like one really, really rare card in like two thousand, like something from two thousand two. Okay. Like that, I think they think two thousand two was his rookie year. Okay. But like, right recently, I've been. Uh, he has a Sports Illustrated, and I those are always the easiest for me to acquire because there's yeah. always some selling. Like I'm like I've been getting them for like two dollars a card. That's crazy. Have you been buying full sheets or have you been getting the uh the um, I've been really the full sheets are a little more expensive, so I've just been kind of buying the singles when I can for a couple bucks, but it's like still like a six time champion, like I just can't say no to paying two dollars a card for that. Can't can't say no. Putting the no in Noah. The, exactly. <laughs> okay, and then well, my my last one. Um this this uh is a shout out to my Marvel, because I love my Marvel plays. Yes. And I'm uh I've been I've said this a bunch. King the Conqueror, I think, is a huge buy right now. And my oh. reasoning is actually very, very simple. We've seen you've so do you know anything about the Marvel market at all? So I know enough about the cards and I know enough about the way the market works and I've okay. seen enough of the movies to follow along in a conversation. Okay. You'll not be getting intel like you were on the uh, the other sports cards. Okay, yeah. So I, I can make this really easy. <laughs> you, Thanos. Thanos was a huge villain in Marvel. His yep. cards very expensive from 1990 Marvel Universe. I know plenty about that set. That I can tell you a lot about. So like, yeah. So, so like, my thought process is 1990 Marvel Universe. Like Thanos. Like that card. It's a hot card. He's like the villain. Like yep. even even raw, they sell for like twenty twenty five bucks all day long, and that's even ungraded. So now I was thinking, like, hmm, like, I know that. So where else could I look in Marvel that has good value? I actually have a few names. Um, the biggest one for me was King the Conqueror. He's actually not even in 1990. He's in 1991 Marvel. Yeah. And um, I, maybe this is a spoiler for people. Like, I'm sorry. It's been months since the shows came out. But he's going to be the next Thanos, like the big supervillain in Marvel. That's I knew that's where you were going. That was going to be my question if you didn't mention it, because that's usually how it happens: is people spec on who's going to be the who's going to be the next villain or what's going to be the next group of heroes, people, whatever the next heroes that get their movie set or movie uh, movie deal here. Yeah, so that's so, so like, yeah, like he's like he's confirmed to be the big huge Thanos of like the next phase of movies, and I nice. can and I can buy his cards for a dollar, like easily buy them a dollar a piece. Yeah. So. I actually know a lot about those 90, 91, and 92 Marvel Universe sets. I had a ton, including the tins and all the holograms. Um, oh, feed me some more info. I don't know. I don't know the biggest about overall. I just know, like, specifics. So, and I'll get in quickly. My second my second guy, I didn't even mention this guy. Yeah, who's another guy? Go ahead. Uh, I'm really looking at, um, well, oh, whew, let me make sure I get my names right. Mo- I'm looking at Moon Knight, because Moon Knight's getting a Disney Plus show. Okay. I never, I don't even know who that is. I've never heard that in my <laughs> And like that's like me like i didn't know like like i was just kind of looking at like, what are the new shows coming out for marvel and yeah. disney plus yeah moon knight has a show coming out and it's played by oh what's his name 
It's the guy who plays Poe po from Star Wars, the new Star Wars movies. I can't think of his name right now. Oh, Oscar Isaac. Yeah, I was gonna say, don't Star Wars. I know nothing. I embarrass so myself. Oscar I'm Isaac. Sure. He Oscar Isaac. He's up. He is in some movies. He's playing Moon Knight, like in this okay. TV show, and like that's where I look for like those TV show stuff. Where like like I remember when. So I know you're not a big Star Wars guy. You'll at least know the name Luke Skywalker if I say that. Uh, I yes, I I am alive, so I do know Luke yes. Skywalker. So like when <laughs> so when Luke Skywalker made his appearance in the in the Mandalorian, how his prices exploded. Yeah. Like how the TV shows like actually translate to that stuff. I think right now like Moon Knight's still gonna be a year out, but I think you can get in buy them for a dollar a card. Like you're gonna be doing really well for the Marvel yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's all about being early to market because I mean you see it. TV shows are a great great example. Uh, you know when the the Netflix show for uh, the singer Selena came out. Cr- oh. uh, Christian uh, Christian what's her name? Christian uh, Ros- Rosita. Or, uh, I know exactly what you're talking about. I can't think of her name though. Christian Serratos is her name. Uh, so she was uh, Susie Crabgrass. She played, um, what's her name, Rosita in The Walking Dead. She okay. played Selena. And all her Walking Dead autographs went, they sold. I, I had so many, all gone immediately. Boom, 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 boom. Just just like that. As soon as like Selena started getting um, uh, on Netflix, like this is coming out next week. Gotcha. But the thing is, people knew she was playing in that role for months. Months and months and months. Yeah. Right? It was, I mean, all you have to do is like a quick Google search. So, that is a very untapped market, so that's pretty wise that you said that um, about about Marvel. Marvel might be the toughest one because of the comic book aspect to it. That's and that's already. that's that's my thing with Marvel. That's why I can't go for. I, that's why I can go for the dollar cards of Marvel. Yeah. Because I know when people look Marvel, they're always going to look comics first, and that I mean it yeah. makes obvious sense why they're looking comics. But if I can still pick up like five to ten cards for a dollar a piece and sell them for twenty dollars a piece, like like yeah. those are the returns I'm looking for. Yeah, I mean people. Marvel's the toughest out of all the stuff out there, like TV wise, to do because Marvel's got such a wide fan base, and there's so many people already specking on the comic book side of it that that you get kind of a trickle down effect for yeah. people that are actually just like you that are like, you know what, I don't want to do this with the comic books, but the same principles apply to the comic books as they do to the cards. Yeah. Um, but you know, so it's a, uh, it's definitely a way for smaller flips with higher returns, which are that's actually how I started off with. Um, getting into cards i would do the same thing i would just feast on 50 and a dollar or 50 cent dollar two dollar cards that i could sell for you know eight ten twelve fifteen bucks yep. because i didn't want to tie up five hundred dollars in a card or even a hundred dollars in a card that I, I wasn't sure if i was going to be able to sell it or not i would rather take the stuff that is almost no risk no risk but there's there's plenty of reward it, it might not be you know shohei otani type you know returns or you know max verstappen if you bought him right when the product dropped it might not even be that but i'm happy to hit singles and doubles all day you know especially if, if oh. you're only in the hobby for the financial side of things that's that's a great game plan because every every once in a while you know one of those doubles is gonna it's gonna get caught up in the wind it's gonna fly over the fence and you're gonna do well yeah. so that's why i've always been like i think that's just me like because like being a college kid like you have to like like you're not gonna have a ton of money to spend on the cards i mean some people do but like I don't have like the infinite like bankroll, so like I have to be smart with where I go. So I always gravitate towards those dollar or two ones that can, like, determine. Did speaking to your double to home run, like, like when I did my buying all those Verstappen tops now for four dollars a card, I was expecting them to maybe get to like twenty five, thirty bucks a card, and like I was gonna make like four or five times my money, and I was gonna be happy with that. And now they've twenty five x. Yeah. So, yeah, every once in a while you get surprised. If you buy the, if you buy the right stuff, you'll be surprised, um, you know, how, how often that happens. So, and you know, I've got, I've got plenty of cards in my personal collection across all different things. You know, my basketball rookie, some of my racing stuff, some of my Pokemon cards where I was just like, you know, I'll be happy. And if it gets to this number, I'm going to sell it. And then I just watched it fly past that number five times over, yeah. you know? So, all, a lot of these cards, you know, you got to remember, they, they start at the basement too, you know, the... The, it's the same same career trajectory as the actual things that are going on in real life, the players' careers. You know that some of these these cards uh, that pass follow. So, um, you know, not everyone not everyone comes out with the hype of LeBron James, and that you know that makes for great buying opportunities for for everyone out there if you uh, can put in the research and are willing to to you know do a little bit of a analytic uh, assessment and um, and find where you think the value lies. So again, no risk buys are always the Always the play for me. If you're not sure, 
just go with something there's, where there's no risk. Where at the end of the day, you can always you can always turn around and sell what you bought it for. And that that's perfect for cards that are a dollar, fifty cents, whatever. That they're desirable enough where someone's going to want them, but not too desirable right now where you'll never be able to sell or uh, where, where everyone's looking for them. So yeah, just smart approach. So my and my last point before we wrap things up is um it's right on this yeah, point. I got some chicken. I got to go eat. Yeah, right so now. I'll, I'll make it kind of quick. But um, so um, I've always been the proponent of buy what you love. And cards, Definitely. and you'll like this will this one you'll this you'll you probably have exact plays like what I'm about to say that hit close to home, but like like I like for my what you love, I'm a big Bubba Walls PC guy. Like, yeah, that's my PC. Like in like last year, like I looked, he was my PC, and I was like, I looked at him and I was like, you know, like there could potentially be a buying road down the line for him, but you know what? Like I like him, so I'm still just gonna buy him no matter what. So I was yeah. buying his cards for a dollar a piece. And then last year his uh, Talladega news came out. Yep. With with all that, so then his card went up a couple dollars, like two to three bucks, and like like that wasn't enough for me to go to sell it, but like I was still happy with that. Like I, if I really wanted to, I could have doubled my money. Mm-hmm. So I was like, cool. I'm happy with I'm happy with this in the PC. And then yeah. and then he decides he's gonna sign with Michael Jordan twenty three eleven. So now yeah. my PC cards that I was buying for a dollar a piece, like I have like fifty base prisms of him. Yeah, like like for a dollar a card now they're going for like ten to fifteen dollars, and like what are you doing that, right? and like I didn't even and like I didn't even buy it to sell them. I just bought them just for a PC to have just a bunch of them, and now it's yeah. like that's so that's why I've always been buy what you love because like even if you get stuck with something like you make eventually like no matter how good you are like I've been lucky where I haven't really had a bad play yet, but when you get that bad play, it better be in something you actually like. That you can look at and say, you know what, it still looks kind of cool, even if it goes to nothing. So you're a hundred percent right that I uh, I have something that it's very close to home with that that statement, um, and it's it's one of my favorite favorite stories to tell because I feel like it um, it kind of reminds people a couple things. One, which is why we a lot of us that have been doing this for more than you know, uh, they were pre pandemic people um, that why we've been doing this and kind of what. <laughs> what can happen over the course of an athlete's career or an athlete's life in your life. Um, I'll try and give the shortest version of the story as I can, because I know we're already going way long on this call, which I knew was going to happen, by the way, just from, just from having met you and talked to you at the National. I yeah, it's that. all good. We're going to talk for 15 or 20 minutes. I thought to myself, like, this guy's crazy. We're going to talk for, like, two hours. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so, when... My, when I was in high school, uh, my best friend's older sister went to Villanova University, and okay. she had just told us one day, she's like, hey, you know, and this is this is a long time ago, the world's a little bit different back then, you know, with the social media and all that stuff, and yeah. you know, now yeah. everything in sports, everyone's just analyzing everything everywhere, yada, 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 you know, you know about sixth graders that are going to be in the NBA already, <laughs> yeah. um, but she was like, basketball team's kind of good, right, and we're like, oh, okay, we'll see if they're on TV, right, and... It took us like three games before uh, we could find a Villanova game on TV. Okay. And the first game I watched was Villanova against the University of Pennsylvania. Okay. And in the game, they were talking about this guy, right? They were talking about this, this freshman who tore his ACL at the end of the summer and was making his return now in December. Okay. And I was like, what? That doesn't make sense. Six months to come back from a torn ACL? <laughs> This guy's gonna be like an alien. He's gotta be like the the most physically fit, strongest, like crazy person ever. It was just yeah. this. And then he stepped on the court. It was this little guy his name was Kyle Lowry. Most people probably know him by yep. now. Uh, but just this little guy checked in, caught the first touch, caught the ball on the baseline, and made this crazy up and under and one layup. And I was like, this guy's awesome. <laughs> from that point on, you know, we would watch all the games, and the team was really good. They had this. Two great years of success at Villanova in the regular season in the NCAA tournament. They wound, wound up being ranked number one in the country at one point. Uh, and Lowry was not the player on the team that anyone ever talked about. He was actually probably the third or fourth most uh, talked about player on the team. But I watched the games and I just knew. I was like, this guy is different. Like, he's good. Like I don't care that he's small. He's smart. He's so much different than everyone else that I see. Like I, I would always think that this guy was the best player on the court. Yeah. Might not put the hole every time. But he's doing the things that lead to the ball getting there, yeah. right? And he got drafted 24th overall by a terrible team. And here I was in college uh, buying all, everything, anything I can get my hands on. <laughs> and, you know, it was 
a broken wrist in his rookie season, and then they drafted his replacement. The, the team had bad luck in the lottery, and they slipped, and the best player available played the same position as him. So then they traded him. They traded Kyle Lowry away, and then, you know, he finally got stuck behind another guy at the same position um, who wound up winning the most improved player award that year. <laughs> and then that guy got – and it was all this stuff. It was one thing after another. Finally, he started playing well, and he just got unlucky. He got a bacterial infection and lost his starting job again. Yep. And then he got traded again. And now we're six years into this guy's career, right? He's just a career backup at this point, just nine, ten points a game, just nothing, right? Yeah. And here I am still going out there telling everyone how great he is, and everyone's like, you're an idiot. <laughs> I'm like, no, nah, my guy, I'm telling you, you don't understand. Like, all these things happen to him that weren't his fault, just kind of like in F1. Like, you know, sometimes just things aren't your fault. Um, yeah. Just a little bit of bad luck. And he gets traded to Toronto. And, you know, we fast forward now from his time in Toronto and over his uh, his time there, you know, he's he led that team in that seven year stretch to the second most wins in the NBA, the second most or third most playoff wins in the NBA, uh, an NBA title, six consecutive all star games. Yep. He's an 80 percent chance, uh, according to basketball reference, to make the Hall of Fame. And the thing is, for me, if none of that ever happened. I would still love my Kyle Lowry collection. I'm sitting here with a thousand rookie autos, you know, logo man autos, his super fractor autos. If it's a good Kyle Lowry card, I probably own it. Um, wow. And it doesn't, it didn't even matter to me that, you know, when all this stuff started happening and Kyle Lowry, like you were talking about your, your prison rookie. I have got like 60 tops Chrome Kyle Lowry rigs that I'm into for maybe a quarter, 50 cents each. Yeah. You know, they peaked at probably 60 bucks a pop. And I still, I was just like, nah. I don't want to sell. I just can't, yeah. you know, and it doesn't matter if those cards never got past the quarter. It doesn't matter if they went down to five cents for me, because when you're, when you buy something that you love, like something like that, like something that I've seen every minute of every single game of basketball, this person has ever played in their entire career. Um, you know, that those cards become part of, they're part of me. They're part of my life. Like anyone who really knows me knows about Kyle Lowry and how, he and I, although never met each other, we spoke like three words to each other once. He made fun of me, which is hilarious, <laughs> um, in our one 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 sentence interaction. Um, you know, the impact that he's had on my life throughout cards has been so profound. And, you know, it's just that's what this hobby was about and I think still should be about to some to some extent. And the funny thing is, you know, you always feel a lot better about it when your cards are going up. But I can almost guarantee you that I'm going to be a lifelong Max Verstappen fan just from he's the guy that I picked. I enjoy watching him. You know, I I like the Red Bull brand. Um, I think he's funny. He's an interesting he's – he's a good personality. And, you know, sports and cards, without that, I would have no, no idea who Max Verstappen is. Max Verstappen could walk could have walked up and punch me in the face, and I would have no idea, yeah. you know, if it wasn't cards. And that's the thing is that's the choice that I made. He's my guy. And no matter what, you know, for better or for worse, which hopefully for Verstappen will be better, because uh, his cards were a little bit more expensive out of the gate than Kyle Lowry. Uh, <laughs> but for better or for worse, you know, that that'll be part of my my life story if I, when it's all said and done. You know, is yeah. every Saturday for the next you know or Sunday Saturday Sunday for the next fifteen years, I watch Max Verstappen drive his silly little race car around uh, these right. weird shaped tracks. You know, so. Yeah. It's a, it, it's something people lose track of. So that's, I feel like it's a great way to end this call is because we've been talking about the financial side of everything the, the whole way through. Not all about that, everyone. You know, if anyone's out there is uh, makes it this far in our long conversation. Uh, yeah. You know, it's it's good when that happens, but you know, don't lose don't lose track of of what what this hobby is about, which is you know finding a way to connect to something that you love that you know. The majority of us are not uh, not blessed or athletically talented or tall enough or strong enough or whatever enough or never got the opportunity to do. So that's that's what it's always been for me, and it's it's nice that I've gotten to the point that I can support my life and my wife and my family by doing this for a living. But you know, when the second that you lose sight of what this is about is the uh, the second that you you'll probably wind up not not becoming someone that you're you're proud to be. So. That's a that's where I'll end my my advice on this call. Yeah, and I think that's a perfect place to end. Uh, I mean, let's end on a positive, cheery, happy note. Um, thank you for joining so me. Not, 
I knew we were going to talk. You know, on, uh, on Nikita Mazepin spinning around and driving the wrong way. What's I up? I can't wait for that to happen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Th- yeah, thank you for joining me. I knew we were going to talk forever like we did in Chicago, so I wasn't really worried about it. I might even break it up into two parts like I did. When I did with Chad, we went two hours. I saw. I so, saw. Like, I watched so, the first videos. <laughs> yeah, first we went, it went forever, so like – yeah, so like I wasn't surprised. I could talk about this stuff all day. So appreciate yeah, you coming on and joining me. Really uh, appreciate yeah. it. Before we sign off, I got to give a quick quick shout out to everyone um, over on on our Discord channel. A couple guys in particular: Justin, Chatty, MQH, uh, Ty, Soso, Sports Card Plaza, uh, Darkwing, Thirty Three Value. Um, I think that's Puck. Can't forget my man Puck Seven Two Four. <laughs> I think that's uh, that's everyone. Uh, just thank you guys for uh, making the community that we have on there great. I know you guys are probably gonna be the main viewers of this uh, this uh, this video. So um, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much all I got. Outside of I got to do my one shameless plug. If you haven't done so, uh, give me a follow on YouTube, uh, Instagram, and Twitter at Bus Breaks, and catch me on Loop the app at least three days a week. Bus Breaks as well, opening all your uh, all your sports cards that you could possibly imagine, then some. Perfect. That was uh, you did it. Uh, but you did it better than I ever could. I uh, like I say in my other videos, I'm I hate scripting things, so I kind of just see where stuff goes. So I couldn't have done anything that elegant. But uh, game was fun. <laughs> yeah. I, um. Oh, this is a quick. I guess this is the last thing I'll say before I sign off. Uh, our our guest for next week is MQH, or I, Canon Cardboard I on Instagram. Care. So uh, that'll be a doozy of one. I've been made aware he's a character. Watch yourself with him. Yeah, he um, yesterday he told – so this, I guess, is a preview. He said uh, when he comes on, he wants to go scorched earth and uh, yeah. destroy all of the people, the bad people on the Discord and destroy the breakers who pull him nothing. So um, oh, you, God, we better, you better watch out for him. He said he's going scorched earth. Oh, jeez. I, I I had one good run with him. We had one one good box. But then I think our next, like, eight probably canceled that one out. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you guys all for watching. And uh, stay tuned. I'll be posting some more F1 content. Have a good one. I'll see you later.